listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm talking with Keith Wallace. Keith is the founder of the Wine School of Philadelphia, which for almost 20 years has offered wine education courses for casual drinkers and seasoned sommeliers alike. In this episode, you'll hear how Keith started his adult life as a journalist in Baltimore, but one seemingly average morning commute with his fiance would change his life forever. The car flipped. She did not make it. I was unconscious for days, uh, which left me with, uh, at first, uncontrollable seizures. I had epilepsy. After spending a few years recovering, he decided to abandon journalism and move to Napa to pursue his passion of winemaking, all while keeping his condition a secret. Would you hire somebody to do that dangerous job who's most likely going to fall and maybe hurt themselves? That's crazy. But I was so sure that I could do this job, that I could do it well, that I was going to do it no matter what. He would become a world-renowned wine expert, consulting clients in California and Italy. And one day, he was asked to teach a class. The best thing that I ever did, the best a moment I ever felt in my life, was actually that one moment standing there and realizing that I could do something and I had this effect. You'll hear the story of Keith Wallace, the Wine School of Philadelphia, and how they would be referenced on South Park? Yeah, all that right now on Philly Who. Stay tuned. Just a heads up, there is some cursing in this episode. On paper, you gotta admit that Keith Wallace's life seems but a dream. He gets paid to make, drink, write, and teach about wine, which I'm pretty sure is every single answer to the dream job if money didn't matter prompts on dating apps. But the road Keith took to becoming a self-described professional booze drinker wasn't quite as easy as that fourth glass of Pinot. And though he is now one of the most respected voices in the international wine scene, he didn't get there overnight. His path has included several career changes, bouts with alcohol abuse, an unthinkable tragedy, and a previously tightly kept secret about his own health. What's even more unlikely is where this path began, in Salem, Massachusetts, where Keith was born into a pious family that was completely alcohol-free. Just imagine Thanksgiving, right? Everyone's a minister, and nobody can cook. Everything is cooked until it's gray. And there's no such thing as garlic. Onion will be like the little, those little uh, marinated onions. That's the only onion anywhere. Um, salt is nowhere to be found on anything anywhere because that's you know the you know the devil's food. You know because it makes everything taste delicious. You know family dinners were very quiet except for of course Grace. You know and maybe a couple of the ministers want to one up each other on you know on you know on the hell and damnation, which is always fun. Great great fun. And then from there, yeah, it was just, yeah, it was boring as shit, man. No alcohol. And in fact, there was a, nobody used red wine vinegar because it was made from alcohol. Even though it's not alcoholic. Exactly. Nope. Not even. So in this time, did you buy into these values? Like, were you, did you say, yeah, when I grow up, I'm going to stay away from alcohol? Up until I was about 13 years old, basically, until I discovered girls, uh, and actually before, until I got my first great job, which was as a dishwasher at a, actually at a gay bar, um, which I didn't know about. I just got the first job I could get. But up until that point, and mind you, you know, I, I had never met anyone who was gay before, but I also I'd never eaten garlic before. So like the whole world, like, oh, there's a lot of people different than me out there and not completely different than me. They like booze, they like drinking, you know, they, they like, you know. Boys liking boys, I never even heard of that. All of it at one time. So it was actually a good introduction to the larger world. But before that point, I was very much, I mean, I had met, I, I, met, I tried to memorize as much of the Bible as I could. I believed in it wholeheartedly. I was at church every Sunday. I was involved in Sunday school. I would be out, you know, uh, any church projects during the week, I'd be doing them. I was a big, big, you know, like church fan. So then once you sort of, got plunged into this perspective of other perspectives, what was your initial reaction? Because the first thing I had, the first introduction that first day was so amazing because people were so nice to me. And I was a very, very quiet, shy boy. I had a really hard time uh, socializing. Um, 
Yeah, no, they were so kind to me. And then for my employee meal, which I didn't know I was going to get, I got pasta. And I had never had, I mean, I had pasta before, but I never had pasta like that before. And it was the most, it was an epiphany. People were nice to me. This was this food I never knew. So immediately my first, because it was about food and people were being so kind to me. So that for my rest of my life, I've always had a love of those who are not like me. And also because I'm also a weirdo. And so I feel, you know, anybody who's a weirdo is my friend, yeah. you know, and that's from the very first 14 years old. Thank God. Thank God for that restaurant. So you wound up going to Salem State College. Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, I always fancied myself as becoming a writer because I was this outsider. And I and I, I do and always loved the, the language. I loved literature. So, yeah, I did, you know, what I loved, which was, and fortunately, I mean, I got a great scholarship. I didn't really pay for it, which was amazing. So, yeah, I got to go to school and do something I really loved. Right. And then when you graduated, you got into journalism. I did. I did. But... It actually took a long time because while I was going to school, I was all I had actually was was working and and it was doing the thing that I really loved, the place that I felt at home, which was in restaurants. And because I'm shy and goofy and weird, I was not a waiter. I I couldn't do that. I couldn't be a waiter. I couldn't even be a busboy. I was just too weird. Um, I was first you know, a dishwasher and then I worked my way up to uh, actually to become first a sous chef and then as an executive chef. How did you go from you know, being in a family that doesn't even use garlic to being an executive chef in such little time. I worked for both some Italian guys, executive chefs at first, and, and some French, you know, and being trained in classical French cuisine, and then Italian as well. And most people have read things like Kitchen Confidential, yeah. and they say, oh, that's fiction. It's actually not. That's actually the story of most of our lives who are working in restaurants, especially in kitchens. You know, when I screwed up, I would get smacked back of the head, bam. And I just absolutely loved it. I loved working that hard. I loved never being able to call on sick, cut, being cut, bleeding, but producing things that were so great. Well, so so this was your passion. However, yes. you, you did go into journalism. You... Oh, absolutely. Oh, God, yeah. Cooking is like something I fell in love with. But writing was the thing that I always truly thought was going to be the thing that was going to do for the rest of my life. The, deep down in my soul, if I didn't, if I don't write, if I don't have, have that creative outlet, I feel empty. It's that thing inside of you that you know, needs to be expressed, that yeah. needs to come out. And writing was the way I knew I could do it, and I could actually touch people. And when I got the chance to write, like for an actual newspaper, I did. One of my cooks at the restaurant I was running, her husband was actually the executive editor of a small newspaper, and they brought me on. As a writer, it was amazing. I got to see so many things, really bad things, but also really wonderful things. I actually did a, a series of articles that was investigating the prisons, uh, especially women being incarcerated. And my series of articles actually got women released out of prison. And after that, when we actually, women were actually being released from jail, that they were changing, Baltimore was changing their policies. So many people were so happy. I actually would walk down the street and, and be hugged. And it was amazing. It was, a mo you know, this is before the internet. So, you know, it was actually, obviously people were sharing the story person by person across the city. It was an amazing moment for me just to like, I did something really good. And uh, that's what I always wanted. I just want to be able to do something, something good. And that was, that was great. That for me, that, that made all like being shot at or like, you know, all the blood and guts all worth it. So then, Fast forward a little bit, you wound up attending UC Davis. Yes. What brought you there? My fiance was in the car with me. Uh, she was driving. It was four o'clock in the morning. We were, she was, we're going to her work and then I would have the car for the rest of the day. We were in a massive, massive car accident where the car flipped. She did not make it. I was unconscious for days. And so, you know, and there was significant uh, trauma uh, to my body, but also I had, you know, lasting brain damage, uh, which let with, left me with, uh, at first uncontrollable seizures, but over time, those seizures lightened up, but, but I started drinking incredibly heavily. So, so you, you have this accident, you wake up in the hospital, I imagine days later, did you find out then that your fiance hadn't made it? It was one of those things you don't want to ask the question for, you know, and I really was dreading the answer and, you know, I knew what the answer was and everyone around me, I, you know, they clearly were going to tell me what I wanted to ask. So it took me some time to ask, but they, people were very, very kind to me. Uh, the nurses were amazing to me, but 
I didn't want to do my job anymore. I wanted to be somebody else. Instead of, you know, being admitted to a nursing home to spend the rest of my days because I couldn't, you know, function. I, uh, I refused, I refused that, that world. And so I actually, uh, I did, uh, it's like my family still lived in New England. So I did, I went back there for some time to work, you know, rehabilitate, to find my way again. And, and yeah, and I did get my job. Now I didn't mind you. I never, I was so ashamed of that, that I never told anybody. I never said anything outside of a very small circle of people. And so I hid that. That I, that I had epilepsy. Why did you feel ashamed about this? We're talking about an era where someone who was gay was, you know, would be beaten up and, or murdered. You know, we were not a tolerant country back then, especially not for people with disabilities. No matter how liberal somebody was, you didn't want to know that about people. You didn't want that. It wasn't going to be something I, you could brag about or say or people would even understand. It also brings in all the questions like, well, you weren't before, now you are. You know, what happened to you? And that's not a story I wanted to get into. You were on the precipice of a life, I guess, I guess, that you had designed in Baltimore where you were doing journalism, you had a fiance, you were about to get married, uh, you were still involved in restaurants, and that just disappeared overnight and, and left you with this disability. It must have been so hard to, to go back home and just completely start over. Well, it felt like it's just the life, your life is at an end. I spent a good six months wallowing in my, uh, you know, self-pity. Just completely, utterly like, you know, like, I don't deserve any of this. The world is out to get me. Clearly, this is, you know, outside forces trying to ruin me. I have, you know, I never have done anything in the world. How dare you? You know, everyone, God is evil. Everyone's evil. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit in, sit in my old, you know, this little room and just drink, drink and drink. And not healthy drinking, mind you. That was like, that was just like, you know, just drinking really bad whiskey all day long. Until so like hoping sometime, somewhere you actually find some epiphany, which I, you know, in the bottle, which I actually never did. <laughs> you never found it out of the bottle. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but you, you no. got out of that funk. So what yes. brought you out? Well, eventually, eventually, you know, I don't know what. I don't know how I just did one day. You know, I just, I was just so pissed off with myself. I just, I just, I was disgusted at what, you know, that I, that I'm just sitting around. I'm like, I can't, why am I doing this? Why am I just, right? If the only thing of value in the world is to do things, good things in the world, why are you sitting around? Why just, right? I mean, that's just, that's worse than, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Just do nothing. You know, anything, anything at all, anything at all. So, and I did go back. So I, that's when I did. I just, I got off that pity ride and I just said, well, I'll do something that I know. So I, you know, I, you know, I applied for a job at WBUR in Boston and I got it and I started working there. So you, you rebuild yourself yeah. in New England. Yeah. You, you get the job at NPR, but then you go out to California. I did. I did because there was something missing. And what was missing was the adrenaline of working at a newspaper and making change. NPR is amazing. I love the people working there. I love the atmosphere. But we're, you know, the joke in the newsroom was uh, yesterday's news today. So we were just rehashing things or re reporting on other people's. And I missed being the reporter about being in the field and uncovering things and doing something every day, having to have a file a story every day and being right every day. And, and that I missed. I missed the, the huge adrenaline rush. I couldn't see myself doing that for another 20 years. So I just, again, I just, I, I was restarting an old life that I already lived in a better way. Now I'm doing it at home and it, it's, I'm just doing, I'm rehashing my old life. So I, I have to make a change. And I, I look backwards to a lot of things I loved in life and things that, you know, and food and wine was something that I, when I was truly the happiest, that's what I was doing. I was around people who love food and love drinking wine. You know, I had met many winemakers while I was in, in working as a chef. And I met so many wonderful people at that stage of my life. That's the happiness, really hard work, you know, and you're making things. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. You're, like, you're always making things. You're always busy. And so that's what I wanted. And so that's why I went back to school. So you had this 
retrospective epiphany in that moment? Like you, you were able to articulate what you just said now then that, yes. you know, I want to go back to this time where I was working with amazing people with food and wine. And then you decided to <laughs> sort of start over again. It sounds yeah. like. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I start over again. I, I did come from completely, you know, from, from, from zero uh, because largely everything that was required of me were things that I was really terrible at. And I'm still really bad at. Like what? Um, statistics. Okay. Organic chemistry. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The things that are required to be a winemaker, the things, you know, the, the, the hard science behind wine production, uh, the fermentation sciences are really, really tough if you are an English major, you know, where the only things you really like in life are, you know, are pretty things and nice things. And yeah, when you actually have to do organic chemistry at a graduate level. It's, it, it wasn't, it wasn't fun. It was hard. I suffered greatly. But you got the degree. Oh yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I was, uh, you know, there was 14 people in my class. I was the lowest rung. I mean, if there had been 20 people, I would have been a 20th. You'd still say you were the top 15 in your class though. So you oh, have yeah, that going for you. <laughs> exactly. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you graduate, you, you get this degree in, in agricultural studies. And, and so at that point you knew you wanted to get into wine. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my degree was actually in viticulture, which is specific wine. It was agriculture, but specifically for wine production. So yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to do. I knew that, yeah, it was just a good, honest job that I, and I could, you know, do something fun and people, people are going to like. So you had mentioned earlier how you had turned to alcohol in, in the tough time and that it sounds like you abused it a little bit. Oh yeah. Uh, oh Yeah. Was there any fear when you entered the alcohol industry of that part of yourself? Oh, that's a good question. The answer is, of, of course not, but I should have. <laughs> yeah, of course I should have. I should have recognized that this was a, that, you know, coming off of, uh, you know, off of massive depression and, and disabilities that I probably shouldn't think of booze as my career choice. It, that, that, you know, but we never, I'm not so self-aware that I could, you know, I'll, I'll own that. That was like a dumbass move. It's I mean, also it's worked out. So oh, it's, far. it's been fantastic for me. But yeah, I know. But you know, for self harm, that was like that was up there. That was a that that really could have ended badly. But I fortunately working with it, it became a normal part of my life, and it wasn't something that you would ever over consume. It ended up being just something that was always there, and it was part of work. So you know, there's there's something that, that you can take the pleasure out of something when it's always work. Like if you really want to hate chocolate. Go work for a chocolate house, manufacture chocolate for three years. You will hate chocolate. You will never want to eat it again. And, it, and all the wine can be like this. So like, yeah, there's certain things like even like, like, cause I was on a Napa Cabernet project and I like still to this day, I'm like, oh God, fuck that. I do not need to drink another Napa cab in my life. I mean, I hear you. I mean, if, if anyone out there wants to stop enjoying podcasts, yeah. try, <laughs> try working on one for hours and hours yeah. a week. Yeah. 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 But, but, okay. So, yeah. so you got into this, you, you didn't recognize the danger there, but it, it didn't wind up hurting you. So once you have this degree, then what's your, what's your first move? Well, my first move is actually, cause I, I was working as an intern as is to work on some internships, which I already was doing. Um, and then my goal, right, was actually, I want to, I got a job as assistant winemaker. And my goal was, of course, over time to become a head winemaker somewhere in California, preferably around in Northern California, where, you know, it's never too hot. It's really nice. It rains a lot, but it's nice. And that was my goal. And, um, but of course, the other thing wasn't really the alcohol abuse that was a problem, but I'm, you know, I have epilepsy. You know, this is, becomes the real major problem when most of your job is actually moving around massive barrels. When you're up on, you know, you're up on ladders that are two stories up. When you're actually, you know, when, you know, you don't know when you're going to have a seizure. It's not like, you know, the seizure gods come up and say, you're getting a little shaky, brother. Right. I mean, and I, I mean, I get migraines and even that I get a warning like two hours in advance, but yours just happens. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, yeah, no, exactly. It's just like, boom, you know, there's no real way. Sometimes I kind of get an idea like a couple seconds before, but not usually, you know, I would fall. And so, you know, it was, uh, it was just assumed that I was clumsy and then also a drunk. <laughs> so, which is not a good thing. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. just didn't know that you had epilepsy. No, I never, because I would never get a job. I would never have gotten a job. And, I. Uh, would you hire somebody to do the dangerous job who's most likely going to fall and maybe kill themselves or definitely hurt themselves? That's crazy. But I was so sure that I could do this job, that I could do it well, that I was going to do it no matter what. And to this day, it's like, I am the dumbest smart guy around. I'm like, I have been so like, yeah, oh, 
you you know oh you have a drinking problem let's go and making wine oh you have you you have shakes oh let's actually go climb on ladders well so what made you know though that you were going to be good at this cuz i mean you said it was obviously very hard when you got the degree how did you know that this is what you should be doing oh i never did oh i actually you i just knew wanted to. i wanted to and from the very beginning i knew that i was never going to be the best and i knew that I was never really going to be really good at it. I knew that I was competent, I knew it was enough, but I knew I was actually something, I was, I was setting myself up for failure and I knew it and I kept, I knew it because I didn't have everything I needed to be able to do the job well. And, and I knew it, I was always gonna be good, I would never be great. And I always was wanting to be the best. I, I have a drive to be the freaking best at anything I do. And I just knew that I was falling short, I was watching, other people in my cohort who graduated with me from Davis, and I saw them doing, they were doing much better than I was. So I had to change tactics. I'm very creative. I know how to do things, but I'm not always able to do them because I'm going to fall off stuff, you know, and I don't know when, but so I had, so I decided I moved the goalposts. I said, I'm not going to be a winemaker. I'm going to be a consultant. So what I started to do was actually just offer as a low rent consultant, there's a lot of ones who are much better, much more experienced than I am, but I could actually go in and help wineries with their production problems, their issues, their vineyard issues. I can problem solve everything and up to like even helping them, like how do they market? You know, how do they adjust their wines for the US markets? And so that's what I started to do. Now, was there a specific moment that that decision was made or was it something that was gradual? It was super gradual. Nobody, nobody ever wants to admit to themselves that they, you know, that they're not as good at what they, they're doing as they, they want to be, or that they never will be. There's just no way that they're going to get from point A to point B. That point B is going to be, because one, I don't have any money. Because, you know, most wine, most, you know, most wineries are owned by families or large corporations. I'm not ever, someone eventually is going to figure out that I, I have epilepsy. So I'm not going to, like, at that point, my career's over. Like, I'm going to be outed. Uh, no one's going to hire me. And in fact, people are going to be pissed because I, I lied to them. And honestly, I mean, I was lying to my employers so that I could do a job that I wanted to do that I loved. And I just knew that this was, I set myself up for failure. So I started just using my knowledge rather than just my physical body. I just started using and working as a consultant, helping people. That way I could work for a bunch of different wineries. There's less risk of uh, any problems, you know, any, any seizures because I'm always, I'm never working. I'm just yeah. talking. I'm always on the phone. So that's, that's how I ended up resolving that. And I loved it. I really did a really good job um, for a number of wineries. And, but most of my wineries were either in California or in Italy. And I got some good gigs in Italy, which was really nice. Then you really learned what good pasta was. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. No, that, what great beans were. And I just like, oh, I learned so much. I mean, it was just such a pleasure. But th that part, that was wonderful. But that's actually just the beginning of the story. Like, that's just the beginning. Because that's my, my sordid tale up until the point that I ended up moving to Philly. Exactly. And why did you move to Philly? Well, it wasn't for the pasta. Okay. <laughs> One, Philly airport is a perfect distance between Europe and California. So I wanted to be able to hit all, all my clients. And if I was living in California, that's a massive, horrible, from LAX, that's a horrible trip to, to Rome. Um, but Philly was perfect. And, and, Philly, and Philly was super cheap and still is. Like compared to everywhere else, any other major metropolis, Philly, is cheap. I mean, I was living in uh, West Mount Airy and I had this huge, beautiful two bedroom apartment all to myself. I was like paying $800 a month, you know, and I had an elevator up to my apartment. I'm like, I, I'm living like a king, like a king. It's amazing. I mean, and plus, again, you know, I lived in areas where people weren't like me and I liked that. And so I moved specifically also to West Mount Airy, that neighborhood, because it was so diverse. And because I'm just not really that comfortable with, you know, when everyone, you know, you know, looks like they're either Irish or Scottish, you know, it's like, all I know is that the food's going to be bland and everyone's going to be boring. So I want to be around and that was, so that was perfect for me. I could get around. Uh, it was very quiet, lots of woods. Uh, yeah. So that, and uh, yeah. How did you find that opportunity though? Like, how did you discover that Philly had these things to offer? I read books. I read, there's so many books out about, you know, different cities 
and you know, but just English major. So I like I just would go through. This is you know, of course, this is you know, not pre-internet, but it's early internet. So I did most of my research in libraries. So you set out to say, okay, I need to move to a city on the east coast so that I can be between Napa and between Italy. Exactly. Which one is going to be? And you researched and yeah, Philly won. Philly is by far, and it's still to this day. I would still make the same choice. It was the perfect place for that, but also it just became a perfect place for me. I mean, it changed me. It changed me in the way, I mean, every place you live changes you a lot. LA changed me, uh, Napa changed me, Florence changed me, but Philly really, really changed me. It changed me in a way from being, a, I was a really angry, self-important prick to somebody who actually really cared and actually really started feeling at home in a place and was able to do something I was really happy for the first time in my life. Philly made me a better person. Oh, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So you moved here and did you know right away how much you, you would love it or did it take some time? Oh, it was right away because I lived right next to these woods and I, you know, and having, if you work in agriculture, you do love things growing. And the Wissahickon, the Schuylkill here, it's just, the wildlife is so remarkable. And I could just walk, I could walk for four hours, just hike, 10, 20 miles with my with my dog and just be happy, be in that. And, th and that's amazing. But also train ride right downtown. Like I was perfectly happy and my my workload was very light. You know, I, you know, I worked maybe 30 hours a week, which was, you know, because I didn't have that many clients. It wasn't that, you know, I did well enough that I could actually, you know, I could. It yeah, was it was low a perfect pressure. You were yes. enjoying yourself. You were enjoying the work you were doing. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and yeah, and and I enjoy, I love the I just loved it. I loved the people around me. I love the fact that I could take the train downtown if I wanted to. I loved all of this. You were living the life. Oh hell yeah, hell yeah. Is this when the inspiration came about for the Philadelphia Wine School? Yeah, around this time. Yep, same time. This time. So so this is around 2000, 2001. This is, this is when I just moved moved in. I was working with a small winery here, here in Philly, outside of Philly. Yeah, but they had you know, but they asked me to to do something that just, just pissed me off. I mean, this was, this was horrible. And it just, ah, oh, like, why would you ever ask me to do that? Me, Keith Wallace, this quiet, shy, goofy guy who doesn't like, he likes being in a wine cellar because he doesn't have to talk to anybody. This is my perfect job. I now work as a consultant. Why? Because I can be at my house and not talk to anybody. So he asked me to teach a fucking class. In front of people, he taught me, you know, I stammered, I stuttered, I, I, you know, he's, no, I can't do it. You need to teach this class. So I, I did it because, you know, these are billable hours. Again, super, super cheap. So I researched so much. I researched so, so much for that, you know, for that 45 minute talk. And I stood up there and I, I'm sure I was completely horrible. I'm sure that people were standing there going... Oh, this idiot. Oh, my God. First off, who cuts his hair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was actually for me the, the, the turning point. I, was, I saw these people and the questions they asked, I could answer them, all of them. And I, and I realized that actually people had really bad ideas. And like they were taught you know, they, you know, the things that were out there in the world, I wasn't exposed to. All the, all the bad, but everyone had all this bad knowledge and all this assumptions about what wine was. And I, I saw it immediately and I could see that I could reach into there and I could actually help them again, like change their minds, um, lead them in a better direction. And, and also I, holy shit, how would you, I've never taught my life. And I so stood up there and I just fell in love with teaching the best thing that I ever did. The best moment I ever felt in my life outside of actually, uh, you know, proposing to my wife was actually that one moment standing there and realizing that I could do something and I had this effect. It was amazing. It was the adrenaline and passion and love. And like, I now found where I'm going. I finally found it. I didn't really ever knew. I worked really hard to do a lot of things, but I never really knew what I wanted, what I should be doing. And when you went home that night, you knew? Yeah. Not only that, I actually took all the bottles. I peeled all the labels and I framed them. And like, this is it. And I still have one. Most of them got lost, but I still have one to the day. It's in my office. Yeah. And I see it every day. It's yeah. So you knew from the get go, this yes. is what I'm doing. I'm starting to teach. Yeah. More. Yeah. Because I knew that I could be great at it. I knew that I could talk, I speak. Here's that messed up thing. I should have known this when I was a kid because my mother's a teacher, a special ed teacher, and my father's a minister. 
So I should be able to fi figure this out that I probably could speak in public, probably part of my my gen my DNA to be able to do this. That's interesting. Quite a few of the people that I've talked to so far have a similar thing where their family did something and they at first either didn't notice it or rejected it and then wound up completely embracing it later on. You have to take that trip. You know, you have to reject it to, to find it. You can't just accept. I, I think you just can as a person that like, just accept it as your fate. Uh, then it's never really authentically yours. I mean, this was teaching is authentically mine. I've never talked to my mom or dad about teaching or how they do it or anything. I've never, you know, I never, I didn't learn it from them, you know, but it is part of the family heritage. Yeah, yeah, totally. So at this point, we, you go home, you, you love teaching this class. Do you decide I'm going to start a school or do you just say, I'm just going to start teaching more? How did, how did that transition happen? Yeah, so I just kept on teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching. And then eventually, I was taking so much of my time that I had to make a decision. Because I wasn't making money at it. It was, in fact, costing me money because I wasn't doing things that would make me money. So I looked at anyone else who had ever, you know, wine schools in the world and how they did it. And I started researching all of that. Like, what does it take? And what I realized is nobody was actually doing it full time. And those who were doing it were spending a fortune, losing money or barely afloat. And none of them were doing it. It was never their full-time job. So you decided to do it on your own. Well, I first started teaching myself the things I was going to need to have to even think about it because I couldn't pay anybody. I was not going to make any money and I knew I wasn't going to probably make money for like five years, but that I was going to have to jump into it full-time and I would have to be my own admin. I would have to be my own tech. I would have to do everything myself just to barely pull out maybe enough money to live. And that's what I did. You were okay with the fact that it wasn't lucrative. You were just so excited to teach wine. Yeah, exactly. Because this was the thing that I realized I could do. And it was the impossible thing. You know, if I worked hard enough, I could, I could solve it. So when you get the school going. Yes. Those first few classes, how did they go? Oh, God. So they, they were good. I thought they were amazing. Hindsight, I'm sure that they sucked. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, because I come from a that science background. So I had a hard time trying to explain things to people like, for instance, tannin. You know, it's it's a, a very complex polyphenol that's created out of multiple kinds of phenols and cachetins and color compounds and that they're oftentimes very, very complex. But that's not what somebody wants to hear. They want to hear a very simple explanation. So like, I didn't know how to give a simple explanation. Like, why do we smell things? Well, because they're monomeric. Of course they're monomeric. Of course, because obviously the, you know, once your pH hits a certain point and you have enough yeast activity, they sever those glycoside bonds. Of course they do. Yeah. Everyone knows this. This is basic shit. So um, I was having a ball and I'm sure that I was speaking, just basically speaking Arabic to everybody. Right. Right. Uh, that said, I mean, it was amazing for me and I apologize for everyone in the audience how bad it was. So I'm sure, I mean, I was, but I was very enthusiastic. So the folks that are coming, are they just sort of folks who are kind of interested in wine or are those people who are kind of, are in the industry and really want to dive deep into the science behind it all? The people who first came were just interested in wine. To be honest, at that time, I was, didn't realize I had stepped on toes. There was another wine school in this city and they were running certification programs and they were very active and i wasn't trying to step on their toes but but calling it the wine school of philadelphia you know oh yeah you did yeah i stepped on everyone's toes and it is again right this is the first time i was ever like truly found my place and i was a little too gung-ho and i didn't i didn't reach out to everyone in the field i just said i'm just doing this and I'm just going in i didn't do the, the political thing like i should have actually introduced myself and said hi so yeah, no. So there was actually a little bit of animosity in the beginning. Now, was there a moment where you knew for sure that the Wine School of Philadelphia was to be your main focus or? Oh yeah. It was from the very beginning. Once I thought of the name Wine School of Philadelphia, from that first class, I, I had to do this because I didn't, right? I have a very weird set of skills. You know, I've done a lot of things. And it's like, but it doesn't fit one cohesive career, except for this one thing. <laughs> so I, I, so I, I was just, I, yeah, you know, again, dumbest smart man ever. I just said like, I'm just going to do this, this thing that no one has ever done. People don't make, really make money on it. I'm just going to do this. Yeah. This sounds great. 
So that's what I did. So it's it's been almost 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, and you're still doing it a lot yourself. Oh, Do yeah. Do you have any designs on scaling or growing at all? Well, we did at one point. So I had. Now, in 2008, we were actually, we had, the school was in Fairmount. We actually had two buildings side by side. We had expanded from the wine school of Philadelphia to also the Philly Beer School, started doing beer brewing and beer classes as well. And, you know, I had a big staff. We had about eight people on staff at that time. And we were running a lot of classes and mostly I was just doing administrative work. We were building out awesome stuff. Um, and I was looking to become bigger. I uh, was in negotiations with a couple of universities to actually, you know, build out our programming. And I was, but the problem there, and there's, this is the problem when I realized soon, especially when the economy started to, to, to falter and really, I had to basically just figure out how I was going to keep my, my employees in healthcare, because I really was adamant that everyone had healthcare and that, you know, that everyone is going to be protected. But I, we started, it was a razor thin margins anyways. And then all of a sudden that just went away. So I had to start thinking, what am I going to do? I also realized then, and we made it through and everyone was fine. And, you know, I slowly over time actually reduced uh, some employees down, but I always had, you know, a good set of employees. But what I realized was that I, one thing I really hated and was really, really horrible at was actually administrative. That's not what I came to do. I mean, actually, so the school was really successful. We were becoming much, much larger, but I also wasn't very good at the management of its side, which is really what I was doing. I was doing a lot of, so I'm, um, you know, doing outreach and management and this. And I, the one thing I wasn't doing was teaching anymore. The thing that I did, I wanted to do, I started having all these other jobs that I had to do. And I got to write more, but I also was, you know, I was in Harrisburg. I was, you know, talking with politicians. I was dealing, like learning how the law works and, you know, all of these things. And yeah, so I know I realized was that I wanted to step back. I didn't want the school to be bigger. I didn't want it. I wanted it to be really, really good at its core mission. And what I wanted to do was actually uh, no long, you know, step in front of the classroom again, which is the thing that I truly love and figure out a way to actually have my employees, instead of being in front of the classroom, behind, right? To put, change my role to be teacher and to put other people in place to be management. And so that's what I did. I basically uh, fired myself. I put people in, char in charge of administration that were actually smarter and much better than I am. Yeah, and, uh, and here I am. And so today you focus on teaching. Yeah, I, I, yeah exactly. I focus on teaching. I, uh, there's very little else that I do now. You know, I, you know, once in a while I'll have to answer a few questions, but I also minimized, I minimized a lot of things that we were doing and actually that were harming the school or at least not helping the school. Like for instance, uh, you know, being too big, being too, so we downsized our facilities. And so we had one classroom rather than, than two having the size, uh, running classes six days a week rather than seven days a week, running only one class a day instead of two. Things like you know, minimizing that, but also like, you know, um, streamlining things like customer support. So we realized that we don't really need phone support. Uh, things like that, very pragmatic things like, yes, you know, about 5% of the people won't want to, they really need to call. But honestly, if I don't have someone who, to pay someone to answer that phone, that's like $40,000. Also, me answering the phone is horror. We tried that. I am such a dick when people start, I, I, I just am so impatient. And so, yeah, it was like guaranteed that if you called me and asked me a question. You weren't going to be buying a class. Yeah, well, like, yeah, they're like, <laughs> man, I don't want to be in the same room with him. So I, um, yeah, so I, that quickly went away. So for those listening who drink wine, but may not know much about wine, would there be one thing that you would say to them that you would want them to know about drinking wine, making wine, just wine in general? Acting like a snob in wine is the sure way for anyone to know that you're incompetent. Because everyone who's a pretender always acts like wine is some sort of like this elite beverage that has like some mysterious key that you could you have to gain entry to for knowledge and that only a very select few are permitted to have a palate. And which is total bullshit. Wine is made by farmers, by people who have dirt under their fingers, you know, 
anyone can learn how to appreciate wine. There's no magic formula to it. Yeah, you may want to actually just get out of your own head. Um, but the and the worst thing, right? If you want to enjoy something, the worst thing you can do is actually be a snob about it. It's the worst thing you can do. Um, it also just yeah, it just it just and it also just limits everyone else. Like nobody wants to be around that person. Like honestly, nobody wants, and I think this is one of the reasons why the school is successful because if you're a snob, you're going to fucking feel like an asshole in my class or any of our classes, any of our, my instructors. If someone starts spotting off, that all they're telling, all they're saying to everyone else in the world, in this, in that classroom is that I'm better than you. I know more. I'm better. Oh, yeah. And, and it's very obvious for me because I can always tell when someone's actually just bullshitting. It's really obvious because when they're saying that something smells like persimmons, I'm like, fuck you. You don't know what a pers persimmon smells like. I know what it is. I have the I have the lab downstairs. I can actually create a scent of persimmon right now. You would not be able to identify it, you douchebag. <laughs> Just read uh, Yelp or Google reviews and you'll see like all these five stars. Amazing, amazing. There's one person that's like, he's a dick. Yeah. And you always know like, yeah, that's the guy. That the that's that the thought. guy. That's the guy who thought he knew so much and he made everyone else feel bad. So I... I believe I read that you were referenced on South Park. Hell yes. That was the best day of my life. <laughs> what? So tell me about that oh day. Oh my God. Okay. Now we've already established that I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm a fighter, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of, so we ran and we still run this awesome class we call the Sommelier Smackdown. And it's great because, you know, we we bring in a sommelier or somebody in the wine trade and like make them actually pair horrific food or like really difficult food with their wines. They have to make it every taste great. And the audience has to vote on that. And it's always just like ripping into the psalm. It's always fun, good natured. And it's, you know, you get good wine and the food is really good, actually. But yeah, it's always. But so we run this and we run this and we get a notice. We get a notice from the WWF or whatever it's called now. I know they changed their names, right? The World Wrestling Foundation. Cease and desist. Can't, you cannot use the term SmackDown. That was theirs. They have a, they had, they, they, they you know, trademark, they trademark. Yeah. And of course I had tried to trademark Somali SmackDown and dumb me. That's how they, that's how they found out. That's how they found out. And so now they, now they come in. I'm like, this is perfect, right? Now, this is scary because, you know, and we talked to lawyers and I realized this is, you know, to fight this, it's going to cost me like $20,000. I'm like, I don't have $20,000. I can't do that, but also I'm not going to back down. So I just, I just send out press releases to everybody. Wrestling Foundation, World Wrestling Foundation is coming after a little wine school. And everyone picked up that story it was in everything from uh the wine spectator to all the the, the wrestling blogs in the, in the world all the most of the magazines uh the newspapers in california even the inquirer picked it up little stories everywhere boom all of a sudden the next month that was like in 2008 in october i get the phone call like dude what you're on south park like, no way, no way. So it was 13th season. I think it was like the 10th episode, WTF. And here we are, right? All of a sudden, it's just this, this big spoof on wrestlers, big science smackdown and everyone, oh, everyone's drinking wine. And that went on for the entire episode. I'm like, holy shit. Do you still use the term? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, they the, backed the, off? Here's the thing. I can't speak about it, obviously, but obviously we still use the term. Okay. So I think that explains everything. All <laughs> right. <need> to. <laughs> well, we'll let it be implicit. That is crazy. So the episode is called WTF? Is that WTF, true? yeah. Okay. Yep, All it's right. called WTF. Oh, I know what I'm watching tonight during dinner. That's amazing. I can't wait to see that. Um, okay, so you have referred to your epilepsy a few times. Yes. And, and you're talking about it now. Yes. But you kept it quiet for a long time. So why, why start talking about it? So not talking about changed how I did things, right? Hiding something like that, that significant, meant that you had to have other lies around that. Like in the middle, when I'm teaching in middle of class, I drop something or my hand starts moving. You know, um, either you ignore that or you have to reference it somehow. And so it was difficult to keep lying to people because I'm in a situation where you're, when you're teaching, when you're teaching, you're, you're reaching into people's hearts. You want to change them. You're really honest and you're raw and you're available. Like, if you're not, you're just a bad teacher. You, you know, you're there in the present. And this really was something that I kept back. 
And I also realized that, you know, I had a lot of students who, I've had students who have MS, I've had students who, you know, have tremors, I have students who are, have dis disabilities, and and also a lot of people don't, but, if, but it's being dishonest, and I felt that me owning up to who I am and my limitations and to why my my life ended up where it is and is actually really important. It's more of a positive thing now. It's a really, it's people that people need to hear, especially now. People need to hear that things can be really bad, but then they can, that actually can create something really wonderful. It's not the adversity itself, but actually how you deal with it that really reflects, you know, you can do so much wonderful things. And, you know, and it's also a point of humor now. I can actually make, you know, I can make fun of myself. I can make a joke, you know, about being shaky. I can, I can I introduce that as an idea, but also makes people, because people trust me and so many people in, come to our classes. So many, they need to know this. They need to know that not, you know, that I'm not perfect. Because people do say, I mean, I have, you know, now I'm, it's 20 years, I have a lot of influence and I can use my influence now to own up that, you know, I'm a cripple. You also mentioned how in the past, society really wasn't as receptive to something like that. So having said that, would you change the fact that you kept it a secret for so long? I wish I hadn't. I really, it would have, my life would have been a lot easier if I had been honest about it. It would have been a lot easier because maybe I did get fired from the wineries that I worked at. Maybe being, being honest with them, maybe I would have, maybe my life would have been different. Maybe I would have gone somewhere else. Maybe I could have actually found a winery that was going to, accept that or find out some value to what I do. Maybe my life would have changed completely. So I think there probably would be, and having talked with so many people afterwards, um, especially in Washington State and Columbia Valley, there's a lot of people. I knew that I could have probably, if I moved there, I probably could have gotten a job. Now I know that. So I should have been honest about it. Yeah, you know, but I was, sh I, I was full of shame. I mean, yeah, and that's not a great, you know, yeah, no, that's, I'll, I'll always regret that. I'll always regret that. There are a few questions that I ask every guest okay. to get different perspectives. In the world of, of wine, what's yeah. the biggest challenge facing Philadelphia? So divisiveness right now is the biggest. It has been the biggest problem. And it's something that I've been trying. That's my 20-year my goal, right? That I've been trying to get this to happen. We are not a single entity here. There's factions. There's tribes. We like these people. We like those people. And that's not, that's not healthy in any trade. It's toxic in the wine trade. Most places in the wine trade, everyone works together. You may have different ideas of this, but there are, there are people who just simply don't like each other. And there's people who just simply will, even though they've never met me, never met me, don't like me because they're in another tribe. And I hate that. It's actually, that's the hardest thing right now is to get people to come together. And because it is, like, we all drink for a living. I mean, we drink for a living. We have to be okay with this, that people have different ideas, different backgrounds. And, and so, and every person I train, that's like, that's one more person with that philosophy, you know, that, that ability to see beyond just small, minor infighting and whatever else that's going on. So on the flip side, what's the most encouraging thing about Philadelphia? Oh God. Okay. It's all upside for Philly. It's all upside. We are so gritty. We're so much the underdog and we always have been and always will be. Like we're small. We're never going to be as big as, you know, as New York. We're never going to be as, as more influential as DC. But you know what? We win more times than we lose here. And the wine trade here is bigger and more influential uh, than anywhere else. We have so many things have started here. So many things. We can do so much, um, you know, because no one's looking at us. No one's expecting anything from Philly. But you have to understand that our, we have actually some really good, uh, we have some great winemakers, we have some great wineries, we have good vineyards, but we have to think of actually as Southern Jersey as part of us, because it is. Geologically, that's, those are our vineyards. We're on the same soils as they are. We're in the same climatic region as they are. There's so much here, so much that can happen here. You think it's a benefit that the wine world sleeps on Philly? Hell yeah, absolutely. Because so many things have started here underground. So many companies, things like, like Wine Access, which you may not know, but that's a, that was a massive million dollar company. Wine Still Sold Out started here. And many, many other, a huge amount of wine importers or companies are based here uh, or in this, within our suburbs. Yeah, there's a lot here. It's a lot of business here. Um, 
And the, which is, you know, what we're part of. That's why, you know, why one of the reasons why the wine school works here, because we are part of that, that ecosystem. Yeah. There is a life here, uh, just, yeah, but we're ignored. So that's great. Yeah. It's better. It's like sucks being the Eagles right now, because now everyone looks at them and says, why did you lose? Not, you know, last year, it's like, oh my God, they won. I can't believe they fucking won. Like, holy shit. And now everyone's like, the whole world is looking at us like, ah. what do you mean you didn't win? Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. So if you could send one message to every Philadelphian, whether a tweet, an email, a billboard, a text, one message that every Philadelphian would ponder, what would you say? Ah, uh, the same message. Let's not worry about losing. Let's be us. Let's just be Philly. We don't have to worry about losing. We win more times than we lose. I mean, that's really it. And that's amazing for a small little town that we are. I mean, come on, we, we do more than anyone else does. We pull our weight and I love that. And I think that's it. I think, you know, let's, let's, let's be proud of Philly. What we, what we are and what we're becoming right now. It's pretty amazing. For more on Keith and the Wine School of Philadelphia, you can head over to podphillywho.com forward slash wine. That's W-I-N-E. By the way, the South Park episode that references the Somalia Smackdown story was season 13, episode 10, titled WTF. Now, fair warning, in true South Park fashion, it is just about as obscene as it could possibly be, and is not for those who are easily offended. But for those who do check it out, the reference is a little subtle for Matt and Trey's standards. But if you're looking for it, you can't miss it. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow along on Twitter and Instagram at PodPhillyWho. Would love to hear from you. Philly Who is a Q9 production. Music by Lee Rosevere. Podcast art by Lauren Carhart. Special thanks to Jacob Jordan and to Keith Wallace for being on the show. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. I'll see you next week. <laughs>